So uh, all my friends in the in the journalist, uh, my friend journalists who have already asked me for quotes out in the hallway. Um, this is my my comments are my personal ones and not for attribution, hopefully. But the distinguished panel here, you can quote with. Uh, Alacrity, because I know there will be many, many, many sort of gems coming from them. Uh, this panel is about U.S. advocacy. Uh, you know, all of us here have you know worked on that issue, whether in Congress or with the administration. Um, and I think it's a it's a good topic to sort of discuss um, with this type of group. Um, you know, I'm here because I think I was part of the very first. I think, I think it was we were at Catholic University, right? So we used to meet up in Catholic University maybe 10, 11, 12 years ago. How long ago was it? Uh, Fifth. Yeah, right. Where you go? So it's not I, very I, long ago. I've been, I've been sort of uh, you know I'm a I'm a, a friend of of Young Lee, so I'm an FOJ, uh, and I'm a friend of Bob FOB, and there are so <laughs> many other people here uh, who are friends both from China uh, and from. Uh, Lily, there you go. Um, so that uh, you know, I I feel at home here. Um, one of the things that I tell groups who come to me about being successful in Washington, being successful <coughs> advocates, is to remember the three eyes. The three eyes. Um, one being have better info, better information, or better intelligence. If you have information, policymakers and you have better information than policymakers have, which most of you do, better information gets you access, gets you, gets you heard. The second I is better ideas, meaning policy recommendations, things that these policymakers can do, whether it's from writing a letter to writing a bill. Uh, if you have ideas uh, of how your intelligence can be acted upon, um, that's important. The last thing, is in the last eye is political influence. Um, that's the most difficult one to do. I think that the Chinese American community uh, isn't necessarily a powerhouse uh, as a lobby group, not when you think about the Cuban American community or the Vietnamese community, uh, even, or the Jewish American community about issues related to Israel or Vietnam or Cuba. Uh, but it's something that I think. Uh, you know, can be worked on. And this group, a group like this, I think brings together you know, many different uh, you know, faith traditions, you know, many different coalitions, uh, and that offers you know, sort of some influence that you can, you can offer. The reason that I think Human Rights Watch and Sophie are such powerhouses is because they bring those three eyes together, right? Better information, better ideas, uh, and some political influence, and that, which gets them access, access to policymakers, so that you know their ideas can be acted upon. Um, so I don't want to keep talking. Uh, I want to turn it over to the, to the experts, uh, and we will have time for um, you know question and answer. Uh, I don't have their bios in front of me. I know all of them, but I would rather they uh, talk about. Um, you know, there's their, their own sort of uh, backgrounds and history. Uh, all of them are extraordinary people in their own way, uh, people I respect, uh, people whose um, you know, opinions I think is, are worth listening to. So first, uh, I guess we have Bert Weitz, who will talk about uh, congressional advocacy, among other things. Thank you for all being here. Um, I have been on both sides of the table. Uh, I worked for a number of senators, uh, worked for President Carter, I worked in the House of Representatives, but also as a private attorney, I lobbied for clients ranging from Toyota and Toshiba uh, to the American Stock Exchange to the Falun Gong. Uh, and uh, I've seen it on both sides, so that is the context of my suggestions. Uh, the key for me is what is known in Washington as the inside-outside game. That is, people like us and others, some hired for a lot of money, some doing it because they believe in the cause, lobbying Congress inside Washington. But the outside are 
grassroots, ordinary people, housewives, storekeepers, others who believe in the same cause, who meet with their members of Congress either here or back home. And I like to tell the story, uh, I don't know if it's from the Bible, but it's about the fool and the wise man. And the wise man sells the fool a donkey. And he says, all you have to do is ask the donkey what you want, and the donkey will do it. So the fool takes the donkey home, attaches him to a wagon of farm goods, and says, pull to town, donkey sits down and won't move. So he goes to the wise man to get his money back. Wise man comes back, he shows him. The wise man takes a stick on the side of the barn, whacks the donkey on his head. The donkey brays in pain, jumps up and heads for town. And the wise man says, see? And the fool said, but you said all I had to do was ask. The wise man says, yes, but you have to get his attention first. <laughs> so the outside grassroots people are key to getting the members' attention. Because even if the people inside Washington are expert lobbyists, members are very busy with Ukraine, with Iran, with drought, with riots in their city, whatever it is, you've got to get their attention. One way, unfortunately, is to have a Hollywood star take up your cause. And the Tibetans have Richard Gere who has been very active on behalf of the issues involving Tibet. Uh, nowadays, almost every Hollywood star has some cause, some disease in Africa or, or what's going on with refugees. Um, and that will get members of Congress, unfortunately, to come to the hearing and get press. But another way to get their attention is on the outside, in terms of grassroots people in their state, if they're a senator, or in their district, if they're a congressman. Scott mentioned the three eyes, and he's absolutely on point. I put it a little differently uh, in terms of your approach to convincing a member to help you. In Las Vegas, if you play on the slot machine, you, you win if you get three lemons. And for me, the three lemons in lobbying are to convince the member that it's good for America, to convince him that it's good for him, meaning political support, and finally, that it's the right thing to do. In the case of it's the right thing to do, um, a lot of potential is in progressives in American religion. Um, I think liberals have tended to write off religious groups because of very conservative types who uh, don't always support social causes, but there are many very progressive religious groups that can get involved. And that leads to my next point. Uh, at the level of this conference, one of the main goals is to unite all of the different groups, Falun Gong, Uyghur, Mongol, Tibetans, because you all work hard for your cause, but because of all the hurdles that we talked about in our panel yesterday to getting America to do more, it is very, very difficult to overcome all of those hurdles we talked about. Together, there's a much greater chance, and I worked for many decades with the Leadership Conference on Civil Rights, over a hundred organizations of all kinds, concerned about women's rights, the elderly, the handicapped, African Americans, Hispanic, Asian Americans. And they work together, they support each other's causes. They are very powerful in that regard. And I think as we continue to strengthen <coughs> that idea, it does not require any group to merge into a single organization. The American Civil Liberties Union, the uh, AARP, the Association of the Elderly, the Asian Americans, do their own thing separately. But when they unite behind a bill or a cause, they're very powerful. At the local level, when you don't need thousands of people, some organizations have more grassroots support 
than Tibetan Americans, Uyghur Americans, or Falun Gong practitioners. You don't need a lot. 20 people is a lot for a member of Congress. But more important is to build a coalition at the local level. I have done this on every kind of issue you read about in the newspapers, foreign and domestic. And I can tell you, having sat with a member of Congress on this side of the table, or lobbying on the other, that there is a big difference between the member of Congress looking across the table when he's back home in his district office and saying, oh, those are the women concerned about our getting out of Afghanistan. Or those are the men who don't want imported sneakers from, from Vietnam because they make sneakers here. Or those are the Tibetans and they want us to have the president be with the Dalai Lama. That's one thing. But when the member of Congress looks across the table and he sees those groups, but with them is a Catholic priest, a rabbi, a local councilman, the head of the League of Women's Voters, other groups who have agreed to support the issue. It begins to look more like a cross-section of the community. And then he's going to pay a lot more attention. Mark Twain, the American author of Tom Sawyer, said it well. He said it's like the difference between lightning and a lightning bug. So if you can reach out in your community, and I can work with any of your groups on how to do that, to get more of a coalition beyond just your group to be on your side, it's tremendous. And finally, I would say that when local uh, individuals among your various groups are asked to meet with members of Congress, they often are hesitant. Um, politics is dirty, I don't want to get involved, it's all about lobbying and money, I've never done it before, forget all that. Uh, Congress couldn't function without information from the outside. There's too much going on they have to decide about. So they, you are helping them, number one. Number two, it's your constitutional right in the Constitution to assemble and position Congress. And number three, your voters, uh, many of you, and if you're not citizens, you know people who are voters, relatives. So it's your duty, it's your right, and it's helpful to Congress. You should have no hesitation. And groups in Washington, like myself, lobbying for the Falun Gong, can write up uh, talking points that you can use and so forth. Um, the last thing I would say, which builds on uh, what Jared spoke in the last panel and what I said yesterday, um, the quiet diplomacy by our government, um, and I quoted Sophie Richardson, has, has not done too much. China's very tough. Uh, we have many fish to fry with China. We want their cooperation, as I said, on North Korea's nuclear weapons, voting with us on Syria, finance, and so forth and so on. Um, the only way that you're going to really get any government, whoever is in the White House, to be stronger, frankly, is with a lot of public pressure in editorials, and citizen groups, uh, when candidates come running for Congress, Senate, or the President to have someone at their meeting in Kansas or Pennsylvania stand up, what about human rights in China? You say you're for human rights, but it shouldn't just be on small countries in Africa. What about, as Jared was saying, what does it have to do with cultural sensitivity when we don't speak out about torture, how can anyone take America seriously about its commitment to human rights? It's what I call, although it doesn't sound very diplomatic, name and shame. But frankly, that is one of the ways in which we're going to have to move the administration. 
It involves what has been said throughout the conference, two things. Educating the American people so that, as someone said, uh, Mr. Wah, that uh, we have a situation as we had when eventually most Americans knew what was going on with Mandela and South African apartheid. Years before that, knew what was going on in India and knew what was going on in the South and what Martin Luther King was talking about. And then eventually, there was enough pressure on Congress and in the press and editorials that put pressure on the federal government to pass the civil rights laws and later the women's rights laws and environmental laws. So that's what we have to do. And as Jared and others have said, and Mike Pillsbury yesterday, it's hard. It absolutely requires a united effort of all of the groups, in addition to what they do on their own, to at times work together, and then we can change American policy, and I think, to some extent, change China policy. Thanks, Bert. Uh, Bert has a long history of, of working in Congress. Not to say you're old, Bert, but you have a very long history in advocacy. A venerable, that's a good word. Um, as does Scott and, 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 and Sophie. Um, and we're all friends, and I think in this uh, human rights community, um, friendships and guanxi uh, is really important because, um, like you here, um, Tibetan Buddhists, we are Muslims, Falun Gong practitioners, um, house church Christians. Uh, we are all one family, and we have the same goal, which is to promote human rights in China, democracy, rule of law. So relationships are, are really important. So I want to start there. Um, my background is working at the U.S. Commission on International Religious Freedom, running government relations and outreach uh, for two and a half years, working with Scott in that capacity. Um, taking our policy recommendations to the State Department, to Congress, and working with communities like yours and NGO community leaders as well. And then working in the U.S. Senate, so as per kind of having both vantage points, um, working to influence um, members of Congress and uh, federal government officials, but also then being um, uh, lobbied or um, on the other side, having others try to convince me to make policy, um, and then working at NGOs like the United Nations Foundation, and now with China Aid. So that's very unique, and I think important to have both vantage points to be able to see what works and what doesn't. So I'm going to go through a few items that I um, learned, uh, and a lot from my colleagues here on the table. Um, the first is, is diversity, and Bert mentioned it, Scott mentioned it, I imagine Sophie will probably mention it because it's so important. The fact that we're all here together, unifying to work on the same issues is extremely important and goes back to the importance of family and relationships and working together. So diversity is, is really important in the way that you advocate with our U.S. government, with other NGOs, and coming together. There is um, one example, I think, in Washington that exemplifies the power of diversity, and that's the International Religious Freedom Roundtable that meets here in, in Washington. And, the co-founder of that roundtable will be the moderator for the next panel, so uh, you should stay and, and make sure that you, you hear from Greg Mitchell, who's um, really led that roundtable over the years. The roundtable is probably the most diverse um, group of organizations, both religiously, politically, that come together in Washington to advocate for religious freedom. And their diversity is what gives them strength. Um, they organize around policy, um, and they support each other's communities and issues, which has a striking influence on our Congress, and I think their own communities. When communities stand together, um, it has such a powerful effect, uh, I think, not only for government, but for the American people and those that would be interested in supporting human rights to see that unification extremely powerful so I just urge you any opportunity that you have to work with people from different religions from different political backgrounds to advocate for each other is extremely important um, I'm going to be going up with some of the leaders here this Friday to the US Senate 
and I'm going to do just that. I'm going to take people from communities, leaders from communities that have um, no direct relationship with those we're advocating for, but just the fact that they're in the room and they're part of our delegation to help support the rights of, of um, different faith groups will be extremely powerful for those meetings. Um, so I, one example of diversity is in the China 18. So China, China 18 has 18 um, of some of the most prominent uh, principles of conscience in China. This list has uh, Uyghurs, Tibetan Buddhists, Balagong practitioners, Christians. This um, uh, group of, of prisoners of conscience, which are really symbolic of the thousands of prisoners of conscience in China, is diverse for that exact reason. And Michael Horowitz talked about it earlier. It's really important that we work together. So that's on the persecuted side. So making sure that the persecuted um, families and uh, those communities work together and represent each other. Um, those who support the China 18, there's a list of about 40 organizations that couldn't be more diverse, politically, religiously, socially. Um, uh, there's a strength in diversity, and if we have these brochures, and I'll just ask that you quickly look at them at some point today to see the diversity of the different groups that are organizing around the China 18. That's extremely powerful. That means that there's no one that would not have interest in looking at this uh, pamphlet and to understand more about the China 18 because every organization that's represented represents some demographic in our country here in the United States and, and even internationally that um, gives an instant credibility and legitimacy. So uh, diversity, I think, would be the, the first thing that I would uh, urge you to, to think about consistently in anything that you do related to advocacy. The other is research. You really have to do your homework. So if I'm uh, trying to convince an, an organization such as Amnesty International or Human Rights Watch, I'm going to do research on the executive team, their staff, their backgrounds, where they studied, why they studied certain issues. I'm going to look at their board, their board of directors, to see the influence that their board of directors has. I'm going to make sure I understand exactly why people are leading in these organizations and their specific background so that when I go in and have conversations, with those individuals and those leaders. I know where my entrance point is, my vantage point to have that conversation is. So doing your homework is extremely important. You need to know who you're talking to and where their interests may lie in what you're trying to convince them to engage in, whatever human rights issue that may be. So research uh, at the NGO level is really with the leadership and the board and the staff. Of course, in Congress, that's uh, their constituents. So religious constituents, ethnic, constituents, diaspora communities. Why would this member care? And a lot of times it's more helpful to engage those leaders within their, their respective state or district than it is engaging them directly. So a lot of times uh, for religious freedom, we'll engage religious leaders in their states and in their um, districts to help um, convince that member of Congress to engage on a certain issue. So it's really important that you know who the actors are, who the stakeholders are within those states and those districts to understand where your points of leverage. And in, in Washington, leverage is really important. It's, it's knowing where your um, points of access are, but also how to use those um, points of access and those actors to help um, join the choir of uh, the argument why this member of Congress, why this political leader, why this NGO should engage uh, on this particular issue. Um, I would also say that, um, uh, and I think it's been said earlier, storytelling is extremely important. Washington becomes so numb to, the, to numbers. We hear through news reports and, and through just the, fear, the mere fact that there are so many in Washington working on human rights, we hear so many numbers about people being persecuted. Um, and there's a level of exhaustion and apathy, unfortunately, that comes along with that. So what's very important and I think extremely helpful in talking about this level of persecution is bringing a face uh, to what this persecution looks like. So when you're able to, um, as in this Friday, when I take a, a few of you up to the, to the Senate, um, these staff members will be able to see someone other than myself, an advocate, to see and talk with the families, those that are actually experiencing the persecution, 
uh, themselves. That's extremely important to have a face uh, to um, to your cause, to the human rights that you're trying to um, to move either on the hill or um, with NGOs. So putting a face um, to the numbers is really important, and also a voice. So I encourage you to to be able to work um, with the families and those that are experiencing the persecution uh, in a strategic way, in a sensitive way. Um, I think we learned earlier from um, the panel with um, Tiana and Ray and Bridget that it's really important that the family's well-being um, and those who are working with the persecuted um, uh, victims, um, that their well-being and um, their level of comfortability in telling their story is met first before your advocacy goal. Um, and I think that sensitivity will, will shine through um, your efforts to work together uh, and to um, hopefully advocate in a successful way for um, those communities. Um, the last thing I'll talk about is, is something I think that most human rights organizations um, are guilty of in, in some ways because there, there really is a, a competition, if you will, unfortunately, for issues. And in some cases, human rights organizations can exaggerate or can can put things in a particular context which um, isn't the whole story. And so I just I really want to press upon all communities here to really make sure that what you're presenting, the cases that you're pre presenting are holistic and represent the whole of the situation in your community or in your, in your country and that there's not a level of exaggeration that you're able to verify the majority of the, the facts that you're presenting. And if you're not able to verify, to concede that, I think the more transparent you are on sharing information, the information you have, information you don't have, actually is a strength. And so I would just um, also um, suggest that in doing, in, in doing so that you recognize international law. Um, I think Jared mentioned it earlier in the last panel, not uh, to confuse our, our own American values, which were important, and I think universal in nature, but to recognize international law and universally accepted rights and norms is really important um, so that we are all speaking from the same page. Um, so those are those are the issues that I've come across with, that I've seen have been helpful and in some cases not helpful, these particular issues. But I, I think, you know, going back to the beginning of the conversation, really relationships. It's really about forming trust and relationships um, with co-religionists, with people of other faith and other political backgrounds. Uh, and taking uh, this on through a holistic, organized, cooperative uh, manner, I think was probably the, the strongest uh, suggestion I could make today. Thank you. I feel left with so little to say. Um, first of all, thanks to um, Jim Link for inviting us to join this afternoon. Also, um, I'm very glad that I was here to hear Tiana and Don Ray and Bridget talk about their new organization. I found those very moving comments, and uh, I think it's a very courageous thing to do. Uh, I think one thing that's a little bit unusual about this panel here, as I was looking across the table, is that not only do we all know each other and we've worked together before, but I believe, if I'm not mistaken, that we've all been in the position of trying to lobby each other yeah. at various <laughs> points along the way. Which is partly a commentary, I think, about a point that, that Cody made about you know people who've been in the community for a long time and know each other and have a good sense of you know what sorts of issues people work on and what they're interested in. Um, but I think it's also you know it's a nice commentary sort of on some of the consistency of the community here. And you know I think when when you and I first met Cody, you were working <coughs> for Senator Brownback and Scott. You were at Youth Surf. Bert, I can't remember. I was already working. I think you were already doing that. That's right. That's right. Yeah. But it's nice. I mean, it's nice to see people in different positions when we all, I think, know that we come from a pretty similar starting point. And I have two sort of very distinct tasks to try to accomplish this morning. And one of them, Cody, just probably did a better job. But just a few minutes on what Human Rights Watch considers some of the fundamentals of good advocacy. Um, what we do internal boot camps for people about how really to be effective in going out and getting people to do what you want them to do. So very quickly, here is our list, which you're welcome to accept or reject. Number one, know what you are asking for and be very clear about what that is. Do not walk into the office with somebody of the State Department or a member of Congress and say, 
I want you to do more, or I want you to do something. It doesn't work. It's not something specific enough for them to respond to. And in a world with a million competing priorities, people, I find, actually appreciate very succinct, specific requests. And so being incredibly focused is really important, and having done your homework is very, to get to that point is important. And number two, and this is, you know, it's debatable how you want to think about this. Make sure that what you're asking for is realistic. Um, I've been in meetings where, you know, another an advocate was talking to an advocacy target, and the advocacy target you could tell was incredibly receptive to what the person was saying as sort of the lead up, but then ultimately the ask was something that was so wildly beyond that individual member of Congress's or frankly the U.S. government's willingness or ability that the opportunity was really lost. So you have to think really carefully about what specifically is reasonable to expect your target to actually do. Um, point number three is make sure you are talking to the right person for the right office. Uh, you know, it, it just doesn't get anybody anywhere, and frankly, it loses you traction and standing to take. A, I'm, I'm completely making this example up. To take a complaint about religious freedom, say, to the Pentagon or to the Department of Labor. It's not what they do. Um, and so there's very little that they can do for you. Um, and they will be sort of mildly annoyed that you have taken up their time asking them to do something that they just don't do. Um, it's important, so it's really important to know who you're talking to. And as a related matter, to be able to clearly explain why that particular person or office should do what you want them to do. You know, what's their interest in this issue? Have they spoken publicly about labor rights or religious freedom, and so you're asking them to follow through on sort of a broader commitment? Is there some legal basis for your claim? Is it that that member of Congress has, you know, I'm making it up, you know, a, a large Uyghur constituents, Uyghur American constituents, for example. You need to be able to say to them, here's what I want you to do, and here's why it is in your interest to do it. This is the benefit for you. Um, and an equally important last point is that you have to follow up. If you show up, and even you can make the most compelling request and pitch in the world, but if you then walk away and you don't follow up, it sinks back down to the bottom of people's lists. Um, so I'm happy to talk a little bit more about that if people want to. Um, very quickly, I think the other issue I was expected to address a little bit uh, are some of our main advocacy targets in the U.S. government, which is a big subject, so I'm going to simplify it a lot. Um, am I already? Just check. Um, I would say uh, on, on China, because I've also worked Asia-wide for Human Rights Watch, so on Southeast Asia, South Asia, North Korea. Um, but on China, I think we sort of, our time is divided equally between sort of three different orbits. One is really the White House. Two is the State Department, and three is a very elastic category of other U.S. government agencies that have an interest in China that has a human rights dimension to it. And that's sort of a big, messy category, so I'll come back to it in a minute. At the White House, there's sort of a, a, a further subdivision. Uh, there's the staff of the National Security Council. Uh, you know, which includes people who work specifically on China and people who work specifically on human rights. And their job is not, they'll, or so they'll say, is not to make U.S. policy, but rather to make sure that policy is being implemented in a coordinated manner across the U.S. government. So often our discussions with them are about saying, hey, if you're really going to coordinate, you need to make sure that it's not just the State Department that's taking a strong rule of law message to Chinese counterparts. You also need to make sure that the Department of Homeland Security, the Department of Justice, and other US government agencies that have interactions with the security apparatus in China are making those points, too. The other office that we sometimes deal with is the National Security Advisor, uh, you know, whose, whose job it is to essentially inform the president and vice president on a daily basis of security and foreign policy issues. Um, you know, those are, those are people you go to often about what you want the White House to be saying publicly, or if you think that what they're saying publicly is problematic, um, or if there are serious policy problems. 
Um, but you know, those are people who are incredibly busy and they're difficult to get at, so you have to be very judicious about when you choose to go to them and be very clear about what you're asking them to do. The other sort of universe of people we deal with sometimes in the White House are speechwriters, um, you know, who are largely responsible for shaping the public rhetoric of very senior U.S. government officials, obviously the president on down. Um, and sometimes even when you can't quite win an argument with policy people about what you want White House to be saying publicly, you can kind of get the speechwriters to rewrite certain things in a more human rights friendly manner. Um, that then you can grab onto and use to go back to the White House and say, here's why I want a policy change, because you've gone out in public and said X, Y, and Z. Um, there are also times when this goes horribly wrong. I'm not going to lie to you. I think the single worst thing I have heard come out of the White House in the last six months was an unforgivable couple of sentences in an interview that the president gave to Xinhua uh, around his November visit. Uh, and there were a couple of sentences about Xinjiang and terrorism uh, and eat him. <coughs> Last time I checked, nobody even proved existed. That sounded like they had been written <coughs> by Xinhua, but they had come from the White House. <laughs> we were very, very, very unhappy to see that language being used. And on that occasion, we went back to the NSC to the NSA and the speechwriters and said, why on earth would you publicly ratify this very problematic language that the Chinese government uses? This is not the US's position. This is damaging. You know, they sort of walked it back a little bit. But uh, you know, those have been some pretty fractious conversations. Very quickly, the State Department offers a number of different opportunities because it is the main US government agency that drives a lot of the bilateral relationship between the US and China. And obviously it has people who work just on China, it has people who work on human rights, it has offices on religious freedom, and on, uh, international women's rights, things like that. You know, you can, we spend a lot of time going back and forth with those people about how, you know, what policy is, how it's being shaped, whether it can be changed, what different kinds of visitors should say. What should be said on occasions like the strategic and economic dialogue, which is sort of now the flagship interaction between the two governments that's coming up in June here this year. And um, you know, obviously we deal not just with people here, but people who are working at the embassy and at consulates across China, some of whom are tremendous allies in reaching out to civil society in China to <coughs> channel funding, to helping out individual cases, to showing up at court. Uh, things like that. Um, again, I, we can talk about things that have gone really well and things that have gone really badly with the State Department. Um, it, like many U.S. government agencies, there's often you know, a significant gap or difference from one Secretary of State to the next in sort of the tone and the priorities. And you have to, as an advocate, be prepared to change with that. Then sort of in this last ridiculously broad category, um, there are now, I believe, Last time I counted, there were 53 different U.S. government agencies and commissions represented at the U.S. Embassy in Beijing. There's 53 different government agencies. And, you know, on days when I'm feeling charitably inclined towards the guys at the National Security Commission, it's because that's a lot of coordinating to do, right? I, I don't envy them that task. Um, but that said, those are a number of those agencies offer opportunities to raise human rights issues. To give you, you know, a, a, a happier example, you know, we've seen over the years various uh, projects undertaken, for example, by the Department of Labor that really do, I think, in very effective ways address problems with respect to labor rights in China. That's very constructive. On the downside, uh, the the Secretary for Homeland Security, Jay Johnson was in Beijing a couple of weeks ago and gave an appalling speech at the Central Police Academy commending the police for their conduct. Now bear in mind this was within the same couple of days that Secretary of State John Kerry was putting out a statement condemning the Chinese government and by extension or more specifically the Chinese police for their detention of five feminist activists. That's when you pick up the phone and call the National Security Council and say, coordination guys? You having trouble finding your way out that paper bag? That you can't get a unified message about Chinese police out between two different cabinet secretaries? And 
you know, so one has to be sort of attuned to the different uh, portfolios of the different agencies and the opportunities that they afford, and then stay on top of them. Again, one of the, one of the biggest challenges I have in my job is simply knowing who does what and what opportunities exist. But know that there are lots of them, and if anybody's interested in pursuing this, we can certainly talk about it more. I'm going to stop there. Back to you. Thanks to everyone on the panel. The, the, the example here, which we, which this group should aspire to, is Sophie's access. If you can get to a speechwriter at the White House to change the language that the president is offering, now that's real access. That's real power. And you're only going to do that, I think, if you listen to the advice of the folks here. Uh, which I think you know is not necessarily easy. Uh, you know, steps like this conference are critically important. Uh, but you know, you know, I talked about ideas and information. Uh, others have talked about you know, sort of local organizing, which I think is the next step uh, to think about where you know you can um, you know, sort of work with people in local communities to sort of get to members of Congress uh, with I think both issues that are specific, as I think others have said, truthful, I think is, is critically important. Because if I get information, uh, you know, when I'm working and I get information that can't be verified or is it possible, I probably won't work with that group again. Uh, I think it's important to have truthful information, as Cody said, specific, uh, you know, sort of asks uh, that can be, um, you know, operationalized by very busy people. So I had a meeting the other day with a group um, who were uh, talking about the Vietnam, uh, there's, a, there's a, a comprehensive dialogue with US and Vietnam, and they were asking me to do something. And I said, it's a great idea, write the letter for me. Write the letter, and then, you know, then I'll bring it to the, the chairman, and you know, maybe we can do something. Uh, I don't have time to write the letter. It's a simple facts, but you know, something that you can do uh, I think Cody also said, you know, and as well, I think bandwagoning with other organizations, uh, maybe even organizations that don't work on China, uh, on specific issues uh, is also maybe also something you should be thinking about uh, because it strengthens your numbers. Uh, it's working with Human Rights Watch, I mean, it gets you some access. Uh, working with the International uh, Religious Roundtable. Uh, you know, gets you some access to other people and in other cases that you can sort of bandwagon with. I think it's very important. I mean, I work, I work for a, a chairman who has, well, let me see how many pieces of legislation are in my portfolio. Hong Kong Human Rights and Freedom Act, uh, Global Magnitsky, uh, the International Religious Freedom Act, uh, the World Journalist Protection Act, and the China Human Rights Protection Act. Uh, so, you know, how are we going to get all that passed uh, without the help of people like yourself? Uh, you know, the, the, like the International Religious Freedom Roundtable uh, wrote a letter in support of the Frank Wolf International Religious Freedom Act. Uh, Seventy different groups uh, representing the broad range. I think the letter said, we don't agree on many things. Uh, we often disagree on a lot of things uh, politically but we agree on this piece of legislation, which I think leads me to another point, which I think is also important, because in human rights, and I think in foreign policy generally, bipartisanship is important. Um, you know, we, we, people talk about the poisoning of you know, the American political system, and you know, both Bert and I and uh, Cody have worked up uh, on the Hill um, for a long time. I mean, there is some of that, but there is essentially some bipartisanship when it comes to human rights issues and foreign policy generally. And you should think about that uh, with who you are targeting as your friends, uh, what you do when you ask people, uh, you know, to sort of uh, advocate on your behalf. Um, bipartisanship is, I think, better. Um, two things I think that are also important, you know, for me before I open up for questions, and this is maybe my own sort of hobby horse. I mean, I think there has to be a consistent, not just consistent specific asks, but I think there are also, also from groups like this, uh, there has to be sort of a 35,000 feet 
sort of an approach, which means I think you should agree upon a notion that what are you doing? Uh, what is it about American foreign policy that you, you want? What's the message? I mean, if I boil it down, one of the things that I talk about is um, shine a light. We are shining a light. Nothing good happens in the dark. I mean, even though maybe the trade people and security people and other people want to push down some of the issues related to China, the, the, the reality is uh, that nothing good happens in the dark. Um, and that is what this group is doing. And we should think about that because I think members of Congress understand that as the right thing to do. <clears throat> Secondly, I think there should be a notion, and I learned this when I was a young, very young staffer uh, from Mike Jendrizic. Uh, from Human Rights Watch. Uh, we have to start talking, to talk about human rights issues as interests, uh, as something that can be connected to U.S. interests in other areas. I mean, we talk about the cases, uh, and sometimes those cases are illustrative of other points. We talk about legislation, sometimes those, that legislation is illustrative of a bigger point. Internet freedom, I think, as Michael you know, talked about, certainly has ramifications for e-commerce and the free flow of information and the you know, press freedoms. So we need to have not only a specific ask, cases and legislation and other issues that we want, but this group should be thinking about that 35,000 feet sort of approach to U.S. foreign policy. It has to be bipartisan, or it should be bipartisan as, as much as possible. Um, it needs to sort of talk about why we are shining a light and why shining a light is important. And fourth, and, or third, I guess, um, I think there also needs to be some notion of how we can connect our rights advocacy with other interests, with greater interests. Some of that happens with coordination, as, as uh, you know, Sophie and I have worked on, butting our head against the, the, the wall for, for years uh, on uh, coordination within the government, but also to sort of think about the things that you are doing and how they could can sort of support other as press freedoms. How does press freedoms uh, talk about food safety in China or food safety in the United States? I mean, there is a direct connection, I think, between freedom of speech, freedom of the press, and food safety. Uh, we should be talking about that, um, except <coughs> internet freedom and business. Um, there are lots of these types of examples, and just sort of think of those uh, globally. Um, so I'm open up for questions. I want to thank our panelists again. But open it up for questions, and if you could say where you're from, your name, where you're from, and a uh, question if it's for the panel at large or for someone specifically, that would be helpful. That's right. Uh, uh, my name is Yashre. I'm uh, the editor of uh, ChinaChange.org. Uh, my question is for uh, Cody, Cody and uh, Sophie. And uh, you both talked, mainly talked about uh, uh, lobbying and advocating with the government uh, entities, whether it's uh, Congress or the White House or State Department. Now, I've been thinking recently a lot about uh, the uh, international, how we uh, build a correlation, solidarity, and network with the uh, international nonprofit organization. I, I'm inspired by the case of uh, the Feminist Five, because during this case, a lot of uh, uh, NGOs we never thought of to work with them before came out, made huge change, like the LBGT community and the women's rights community. So, and also last year, remember Cao Xun Li at the uh, uh, UN uh, Geneva, all these NGOs held up her picture and really, really made a huge impact. So I'm, my question for you two is that, uh, um, is that the direction we should uh, start thinking about, not just the focus on getting State Department uh, a statement from them or something like a letter from a senator, I think there's great potential to be done in this area because uh, these NGOs have no particular uh, interest entwined with the China. They don't do trade with the China, but uh, they could have a lot of uh, human power there uh, to be mobilized. So it's a comment and also a question for you to think about. 
Okay, thank you. Um, for those of you who aren't familiar with um, Yashir's work at China Change, I really commend you to it. It's a fantastic source um, in, in recent weeks of things like wonderful interviews with people who've worked with Beijing Five. Uh, uh, Yashir, we're huge fans of, of your organization. It's a great point. I mean, there's plenty of room and lots of opportunities to work with other NGOs across the world. Um, often, you know, the the reason, if it doesn't happen, it's often simply because either there isn't sufficiently common interest in a given development, there's not a lot of time, um, and that coordination can, can take a lot of work. Uh, I mean, I think part of what was so effective or, or made a certain amount of coordination which wasn't really all that coordinated on the case of the Beijing Five was that you know the, the treatment of these women was so egregious, right? It was so obvious. It was so well covered in the press, and you know for an organization like ours, which has people who both work on China and people who work on discrimination in LGBT rights and women's rights, you know, I, I, well, point to our friends from Amnesty who are here today too. You know. We're in the position to be able to immediately say to our colleagues within our organization, reach out to all your contacts, tell them to get rolling, objecting publicly to this treatment, mobilizing people who will speak up. You know, we, we have networks that we can go out to. Um, and I think, again, part of what made this case successful was that actually so many different constituencies spoke up so quickly, so clearly, and essentially had all come to the same conclusion without requiring any kind of formal coordination or cooperation. Um, you know, the same with, with you know, just the horrible case of Tsao Shun Li's death last year, I think especially for a lot of the NGOs that work at the Human Rights Council in Geneva and have observed how incredibly intransigent the Chinese government has been there, even if they didn't have a particular interest in her case, or even if they weren't especially interested in the UPR itself, I think demonstrating you know, the, the, the incredible hostility that governments will show towards activists who want to be involved became a very uh, compelling rallying point for lots of different organizations. But I think often you know, it can be difficult to have any sort of formal, scheduled cooperation, largely because people have lots of different interests, and they have different competing priorities. And you know, the, if it's helpful, the way I think about this for our work is to, is to kind of constantly be on the lookout for anybody who's interested in joining forces on a particular issue, even if we're not necessarily going to be able to work on other issues together. Um, I do think that the more voices and the more diverse voices, as everybody said today, packs quite a punch. It's a very effective way of making a point. Um, but I also think it's not wise or practical to expect everybody to coordinate on everything all the time. Um, I think that often winds up backfiring. So hopefully that, that helps speak to some parts of your question. I'm sure Cody will improve on it radically. I don't know if I can improve, um, but I'll add to it. Uh, international advocacy and, and advocating um, with organizations like the United Nations, with ASEAN, with um, regional organizations is extremely important. And also important is organizing among international communities and so that there's a, um, a inevitably a natural kinship with faith communities and other communities that are in a specific region or even throughout the world that are experiencing the same level of persecution um, or have the same issues that they're able to, to come together and work um, to help uh, lobby, if you will, an international forum. Um, those international NGOs, uh, those multilateral organizations that are working um, in a particular region or, as I said, throughout the world. So organizing that level can be extremely, extremely helpful. Um, uh, as a side, China is working with a number of organizations to organize an international conference in Taiwan at the end of this year with that purpose. With bringing together international um, NGO leaders, religious leaders, government leaders to come together to think about how to work together in the Asia-Pacific region. Uh, the name of it is the Asia-Pacific Religious Freedom Forum. 
specifically looking at religious freedom, but it's an opportunity to bring together um, uh, those leaders on this issue to um, create new mechanisms, strengthen existing mechanisms, to work on issues together at those different levels, at the religious level, at the NGO level, and at the government level. So those are those are extremely important endeavors, and I might just add that, you know, as Scott was saying, there are, there are a number of issues that unify um, human rights. I think one that maybe has not been mentioned is national security. Um, a lot of times, religious freedom, uh, more and more, and I think rightly so, has been talked about in the in the arena of national security. But I think that extends to global security, and I think that extends to global economy and human rights. Countries that protect human rights, civil rights, including religious freedom, are more likely to have uh, economic prosperity, a thriving civil society, a level of security. And, and that's something we know through quantitative data, through the work of Brian Grimm and his research. So we know when a country um, respects the rule of law, that along with that comes a stable, prosperous country. So that's an international um, and universal idea and concept. And so those, that type of language needs to be included in our advocacy. And that this is um, verifiable that when we have human rights, we have a stable world. So I would just add that as um, part of um, the level of advocacy that when we talk about why these issues are important, it's because it's for the stability really of, of our world. Professor Shaw. Right. Uh, I'm Yeri Amsha from Cato Institute. My, uh, yesterday afternoon, uh, uh, national security expert uh, Michael uh, Pittsburgh, he said that the Pentagon uh, thinks the threat from China is getting less in the last past 20 years. I, I disagree with that judgment, but my question is how can we persuade or try to talk with sort of the, uh, the, the guys in the uh, Pentagon or the Congress. Uh, my question raised to uh, Scott and Bert. Thanks. Um, I, I don't know quite how to answer it because of uh, two things. I started in this town, and uh, you have to believe in redemption and salvation. Uh, working on nuclear missiles and nuclear missile submarines and aircraft carriers for Secretary of Defense McNamara. And then uh, when I got to the Congress, I was working for liberal members on cutting defense budgets. But I followed defense issues, and the uh, U.S. defense industry uh, has grossly exaggerated the threat of Chinese military capability. Um, it's, it, it's nothing compared to ours. They got a used, beat up, small, outmoded aircraft carrier from Ukraine and all of a sudden they're a threat in the Pacific. On the other hand, they are clearly, and, and, and the, the threat of China's military might is used to keep our defense budget up way above what we need, as well as other people's defense uh, threats. But on the other hand, they are clearly very aggressive. They clearly uh, want to expand their influence where they can through military threat uh, or risk in the South China Sea, throughout the whole littoral, and so forth. Um, so I'm ambivalent in response to your question. But I think that with regard to any issue, um, the start is public information for the American people and educating them because if they can be scared that China today is a threat to Kansas, then they will be for, you know, just spending all our money on defense and, and, and when we have needs at home and so forth. Uh, but I think that to the extent you can link, as Cody just said, national security interests the degree to which, uh, not not just militarily, uh, Mike Pillsbury was talking about the fact that we have um, Chinese military officials going to our strategic air command in uh, 
Omaha, Nebraska, and having all sorts of cooperative military exercises. And I think, as uh, Scott said, and Sophie said, one thing is to have every government agency raising human rights when we talk to them. But for me, the link to national security is that countries that are not democratic, violate the rule of law historically, as Scott said, are traditionally more aggressive. And we know that. We also know that countries that can't be trusted to keep their promise, whether it's the promise to the people in their constitution and laws, which China has some great laws and constitutional provisions, and then the judges are told by the Communist Party, ignore the evidence, ignore the laws, here's what you do to this uh, prisoner of conscience. Or if they cheat and lie and are not trustworthy on economic uh, agreements, uh, then they can't be trusted in other areas. So I think uh, that, but I just want to make, go back to what I said earlier about local grassroots uh, activity. Uh, for some of you, you may be involved with the Washington lobbying efforts of your organization, but some of you are not. You're just back home. And uh, what I failed to mention is that many experts on lobbying, in my judgment, leave half the juice in the grassroots lemon. And the reason they do is after they meet with the members or send a letter to the members, they don't use the local press. When the congressman meets with 10 of you or gets a letter from every religious leader in his town, he can go like this if he wants to. But if you then speak to the press and you put out a press release or talk to the local newspapers who are always looking for stories about the fact that a group of people in the community have asked Congressman Jones, even if he says I'm not interested, have asked Congressman Jones to be the leader in stopping this horrible torture in China or something else. And then, sometimes after a story, you can get an editorial about it. <coughs> then the congressman knows that 400,000 people, the amount in each district, have seen it. He's not going to be as quick to toss it. And we have gotten people to change their vote at the last minute because of a news story or an editorial. So that aspect, after you meet with members, is key. And in general, if any of you are interested in trying to do grassroots lobbying, which ultimately will come not only to the attention of your congressman, but the White House and the administration screens newspapers all over the country. And they either know that an issue is not on the minds of any Americans, because they're thinking about getting their kid into college and jobs in Ukraine and Iran, or they see it is beginning to get on the minds of the American people. And we have, if you contact John Lee, a pretty good blueprint for how to organize grassroots, how to get a meeting, how to present the arguments. Um, the key thing is what Sophie said, a well-defined, realistic ask, and how to use the press. So please, if you're interested, contact John Lee about that. I want to get uh, as many questions in before we have to go. I see three. Uh, and why don't we just line them up here. Ting Biao first, uh, Bob Fu, and then there's a gentleman back there. So can you go here, and then to Bob, and then to the gentleman in the back? And why don't you ask the question, three questions, and then we'll, uh, we'll answer. Thank you. My name is Ken Biao, a uh, scholar and humorous lawyer. Um, uh, you know, uh, uh, Yahoo has pro provided uh, uh, private information to Chinese government, and then Su Tao and, and some other bloggers and uh, journalists were sentenced to 10 years or, or, or 8 years. And, and Cisco uh, also uh, cooperated with Chinese government uh, uh, regarding the internet censorship. So um, I'm not, not talking about uh, uh, CSR. Um, and my, my question is, uh, what can we do to, to punish these Western business who um, uh, are helping uh, the, the perpetrators? Okay. 
Uh, my name is Bob, uh, Bob Fu um, uh, from China. Um, Scott talked about the three or four eyes, right? The first one is uh, information. And I really want, I mean, of course, uh, we have been working together uh, on the, the important, not only the importance of the information, but I think the critical importance of the accuracy, the credibility, the, credible, the credibility of the information. Uh, because you can have, you can build, you know, big media organization, have big rallies, but if your information is not accurate or exaggerated or, you know, overestimated, uh, that's the real issue. So I, you know, want the panel to, you know, for education purpose, uh, to really comment on that. How important. Okay. Um, I'm Sadin, I'm uh, the one that you delegate from Dharam Salah. Uh, so advocacy I've always felt is really important. Uh, this was something that has been highly invested in the Tibetan community because we have uh, Tibetan lobby team in India, US, Australia, and elsewhere. But uh, having said that, um, I just wanted to know your thoughts on, uh, you know, there are so many successful nonviolent movement too, where there are very little advocacy, successful nonviolent movement where there are very, very uh, little investment on advocacy. So just wanted to know, you know, know your thoughts on how really, how important it is of advocacy in, in the nonviolent movement. Why don't, we, uh, why don't we take all three of those uh, as you were? You want to go first? Yeah, I'll surprise you and be brief. Um, <laughs> with regard to credibility, about the last point, uh, that's absolutely true. I mean, uh, some lobbyists have millions and millions of dollars to lobby with. People like Sophie and I have only our credibility. If you don't have that, you, you have nothing in terms of effectiveness. Uh, with regard to corporate liability, um, we do have the Alien Tort Claims Act, uh, which is used when overseas there are uh, state governments or state actors who do bad things, uh, and you can sue if you're a victim here. Uh, there's a case in the Supreme Court that wasn't decided right. I'm working with a coalition of human rights, environmentalist, and corporate accountability people on legislation that may change that. Uh, but the most potent thing, we see it all the time, is where consumer groups uh, lobby and publicly try to get people to not buy products of a company because of what it's doing in the Brazilian rainforest or because of what it's doing here in America in terms of how it treats its employees. And that's a tremendously powerful tool. Uh, I'm just, first of all, talk about the information, the importance of information. Um, I mentioned it in my opening remarks and, and Scott's mentioned it. Information is so important um, and to be able to verify. And I think in, in my opening remarks, I talked about having a level of transparency um, and conceding when you have facts that are verifiable and when you have um, information that you believe is relevant but you're not able to verify. And I think that level of transparency builds trust. And really in sharing information, the foundation is trust. And as Scott said earlier, if you work with an organization, and they provided information, and they found that information to be not true, Scott would, as he said, most likely not work that organization again. So the ramifications of providing bad information are very, very big. So I just, I, I, I again, will ask you and urge you to make sure that when you have verifiable information, you're able to present some level of documentation or um, uh, some reporting from uh, new sources on the ground, and if you're receiving information, not able to verify, to, to continue to share that information, but to concede that it's not indeed verifiable. In answering the question uh, regarding um, Yahoo and companies that are working inside of China, there's a couple different ways to look at it. The first, I think, um, should be in the, the context of what's been done in the realm of human trafficking, and Bert touched upon it a little bit. In human trafficking, um, Organizations have been very successful in um, letting the American people know what companies are gaining profit 
on the backs of slaves um, at the cost of, of human dignity and life. And so when you're able to identify companies that are working within China and they are not uh, adhering to uh, internationally accepted uh, human rights laws and um, concepts, that you're able to, to bring those uh, companies accountable by talking about those abuses, by talking about the fact that this American company, uh, which represents American values throughout the world, um, is not able to adhere to these international recognized laws. That's important. So there's a level of advocacy that needs to happen with U.S. companies. And it, lack of a better term, it's name and shame. If these companies are, are working in China, then and they're not adhering to these laws and um, concepts of human rights, then, then those companies need to be held accountable. And I think in the public square is where that needs to happen. So I, you know, I urge you, again, coming back to my first point of information, that we have to be able to verify in some ways that these um, uh, companies are, are doing this. But I think it's really important. And we have a lot to learn um, from the, those advocates um, that are working on human trafficking, because they've done a very good job of doing that. Um, as far as advocacy, um, and uh, one thing I would say in peaceful advocacy is, is learning um, the concepts of civil disobedience and the work of Gene Sharp and understanding the tactics in working through civil disobedience and advocacy and what, and what works and what's appropriate. Um, I think if you read a lot of Gene's work, it's a lot about organizing and coming together and the level of cooperation and having a single focus. Um, but I would commend you to um, the work of Gene Sharp on, on civil disobedience as it relates to advocacy. I'm going to try to make four points very quickly. Um, on the point about, is it? Yeah, go on. Oh, <laughs> I thought you were telling me I only had one. Um, uh, does that mean I can also ask where I get one of those fabulous team Tibet jackets, the guy who just went out the room was wearing? I give a lot of money for one of those. 1999 on eBay. Helpful. Oh, it's, uh, it's on Alibaba, too, but it's only, it's only $5.99 on Alibaba. I'm betting it's not on Alibaba. Um, uh, on the point about nonviolence, uh, one's non commitment to nonviolence or, or you know, that status and, and you know, peaceful advocacy, you know, we live in a time when now you are competing for government's attention when they are overwhelmed by groups who are practicing fantastically violent advocacy, and it, it takes up a lot of their time. Uh, I think some of the, the conflicts in the Middle East, ISIS and other groups have sucked a huge amount of attention away from you know, precisely issues like Tibet. Um, but I think in that sense, it's that much more important to say we are committed to change peacefully. This is who we are and how we do things. And, and to you know, paint that contrast for your audience. They should find it that much more compelling given the state of the world today. Um, on the point about, uh, Tom Lodger, your question about um, corporate advocacy. Um, I have three answers to that. You can sue them, although that's gotten a lot harder to do. You can embarrass them, um, but that takes a fairly sustained effort um, there's also, I'm, I'm thinking of efforts HRW has been involved in, in informing shareholders, I mean specifically targeting companies' shareholders so that people who actually literally own a piece of the company know what they own because that can be a very effective way of forcing a company to change a policy. At shareholders' um, Right, at shareholders' meetings. And so, you know, it's, it, I mean, it's not rocket science, it's not terribly complex, but you know, there are some specific strategies that you can use specific to target shareholders of particular companies, and we can talk a little bit more about that um, if you'd like. Uh, where's the person who asked the question about credibility? Or about fact? Well, oh, well, of course, we've got your question. Nothing matters more. I mean, look, if you get your facts wrong, the person sitting on the other side of the table can just say, you're wrong, why should I talk to you? You know, human rights watch researchers would probably say that we tortured them in going back over and over and over and over again about their facts and whether their assessment 
is accurate. I mean, every document that comes out of Human Rights Watch has gone through multiple levels of review precisely for that purpose. Because if we get it wrong, nobody listens to us. You've just removed yourself from the game, and that's why I think it's very important to be accurate. And, and just very quickly, on the point that Bert was making earlier about you know, the influence that, that constituents can have, um, especially for those of you who are US citizens, you know, what, again, when I worked Asia-wide, the community that I thought was sort of an extraordinary standard bearer you know, for embracing and really making use of their status as U.S. voters uh, is the Vietnamese American community, which, you know, for a long time in the U.S. was very um, divided about the current government in Vietnam and whether people should go back and visit and how people felt about it. And, you know, after a period of time, I'm radically simplifying this story, I think there was a recognition that working together and specifically using their status as U.S. voters was very effective. And there are, I would say, at least eight or ten members of Congress you know, who are unbelievably well informed about human rights abuses in Vietnam because their constituents will not allow it to be otherwise. Uh, and they know they really have to be informed and responsive and very aggressive on those issues. And you know, I'd be happy to make contacts with people with that community because I think they have been very impressive you know, and they don't necessarily all agree about everything, but they're incredibly good at making their members of Congress represent their interests. Yeah, when I when I first started working with the Vietnamese community, uh, I mean, they, they, really they didn't they, they didn't they had no they had no idea how to do the things that they're doing now. Uh, you know, I, and I think a lot of this was was taught in the very same way that you know the things that we are talking about uh, they put into practice. Uh, and over the last 10 years, I think it become, you know, fairly effective. Even though they're even dividing now, uh, you know, between different groups, uh, but they are they speak with one voice and they speak, um, you know, with uh, that 35,000 foot. You know, why it's important for U.S. foreign policy and U.S. interests. They also speak in specifics about what cases uh, and what others, you know, issues have to be raised. I just wondered, uh, hey. I've also worked with the Viet Cong and Vietnamese, and they're working now on the uh, foreign trade agreement, uh, and very effectively. Uh, but I wanted to go back to the question raised by the gentleman, the Tibetan gentleman, about nonviolent action. Uh, it came up yesterday, and I repeated today how eventually Americans uh, were aware of apartheid and what Mandela was doing. They were aware, obviously, of King and civil rights efforts in the South and segregation. They were aware of Gandhi and the independence movement in India. But it wasn't just that they had information about what was going on and the terrible things that were done. What captured the imagination of American citizens busy with their own lives and concerns in all three cases? It was the nonviolent aspect of the resistance and the bravery and persistence that that symbolized. So it is a very powerful tool. Any other questions? One more. Last one. Um, I'm Gil Kazuna from George Washington University. Could you give us some insights into China lobbies and their activities and uh, how they how they can become an obstacle to uh, Chinese human rights activists here in China? Can you give me a, an example of a China lobby that you're thinking of? Can you give me an example of a China lobby that you're thinking of that's an obstacle? Yeah, how they can become an obstacle. No, no an example of a China lobby that's... Yeah, of an example. I'm asking you what uh, what organization is that is a China lobby that's an obstacle? Is there something that you had in mind? Well, I'm just, um, I don't know the specifics, but uh, you know, like uh, general examples of China lobbies and you know how they can influence uh, U.S. foreign U.S. foreign policy and and, and how their activities can become an obstacle. Okay. The Washington Post is the main Washington newspaper. 
once a week on Wednesday, everyone in Washington gets to read China Watch. It's an insert in the Washington Post. At the very, very, very bottom, if you have a microscope, you can find out that this is published by uh, China Daily in Beijing. And because it is an agent of a foreign power, it has to file papers with the Department of Justice. Most people in Washington, when they read this, and they open it up and they see how happy the people are in Tibet, and how the Han and the Uyghur are working cooperatively in Xinjiang province, think if they're reading the newspaper. That's one example. Let I me mean, um, just uh, continue in that example in, in media. The um, reach of the Chinese government, as most of you know, is very, very long. Um, that reach extends beyond print, newspaper, but into, of course, um, uh, television. So. Um, most of you probably know that uh, in the United States, the Chinese um, television stations, majority of them are actually owned by the Chinese government. And so their level of reach, even to uh, diaspora communities here in the United States, is, is very long. So in addition to, to media, uh, government-sponsored media, uh, state-run media, um, there's also the reach of the Security Bureau. So most of you in this room also know that they, and at some point here in the United States, have actually seen uh, undercover, if you will, not so much uh, successfully, um, uh, security bureau agents here in the United States. They are throughout the world. Um, so uh, when you're in China, of course, you see them. Um, but when you're in the United States, they are, they are here as well. Um, and, and sometimes those um, agents are, are here to intimidate um, dissidents that are now in the United States. Um, in a lot of cases, um, we have uh, embassy representatives that come to hearings, and we have a not-so-undercover representation of the Chinese government in government meetings, uh, sometimes invited, sometimes not invited. Um, so I think it's kind of a known factor that the Chinese government's reach is very long, and in addition to media, they are often at events like this or other conferences or other government meetings uh, when they're able to gain access. So um, their lobby is based on intelligence, gathering in, in, intelligence and information to help guide their strategy in um, being a, a counter leverage to our efforts. Um, so I would say that, that the reach is, is very long. Would, would any representatives of the Chinese government who are here please stand up? <laughs> Go ahead. So, I'll say two quick points. One is that, at least in principle, you should be able to look up on the Department of Justice's website. You go to the link for the Foreign Agents Registry. What's the other A for? Oh, I don't remember. The acronym is FARA. And in principle, everybody in the U.S. who lobbies on behalf of a foreign government is obliged to register with the Department of Justice and disclose that status. Now, not everybody <laughs> actually who should do that does, but it can give you a sense of what kinds of uh, PR firms, lobbying firms, law firms uh, represent various governments. Now, as far as I know, there are only one or two individuals who've ever been publicly listed there as representing PRC interests. There are several different organizations uh, that are registered lobbyists for Taiwan, for the ROC. Uh, but it's worth checking periodically. Uh, look, I think the other, uh, uh, the other block that creates obstacles is not just the American, but the international business communities, you know, who for decades have argued for lesser restrictions, greater access, uh, you know, fewer uh, obstacles or conditions to be imposed on rights-related concerns. And those are represented in lots of different ways. And, you know, it's, it's probably not a terribly charitable instinct on my part when I now read reports put out by, for example, the U.S. Chamber of Commerce in China or the EU Chamber of Commerce in China whining about how their offices have been raided and they can't keep their information safe. You know, and you think to yourself, this happens 
to peaceful critics of the Chinese government in China all the time. And, and you people won't speak up on their behalf, and we're all now supposed to be worried about you. You know, obviously I have fairly strong feelings about this, and they're not very nice. Um, yeah, but this is an incredibly powerful constituency that is very difficult to end run or outrun. I think the best, the best we've tried to do is simply say again and again to this community, gosh, how terrible you're having these problems. We know lots of people who are in similar or worse situations, and could you please speak up on their behalf or at least push for the kinds of change that helps them and helps you? I, we're going to have to wrap up now. I mean, one thing that, uh, you know, the Congressman Chris Smith uh, is doing is also looking at China's soft power, um, particularly when it comes to universities uh, in America, but also U.S. universities going to China uh, and establishing campuses. Uh, the universities, in some ways, have become, you know, sort of, uh, you know, soft power outlets. And so we're, you know, we're so we're holding hearings on both the Confucius Institutes. Uh, Professor Shah was uh, uh, you know, one of the folks that testified. Are we going to have hearings coming up on, on the campuses in China, from NYU and Duke and other places like that? You know, to sort of look at not um, at, at what U.S. universities are agreeing to. We all know what U.S. businesses sometimes have to do to get access to China. Uh, we may not like it, uh, but they're all talking about the bottom line. But a U.S. university whose goal is academic freedom uh, as its basis uh, for its, its reason to be, freedom of inquiry, freedom of speech, if they are bargaining that away in order to get access to the China market or Chinese students uh, or Chinese money, uh, that's a problem. Not that we're against you know, students coming here. We, 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 uh, we support that wholeheartedly. Not that we want, we don't want U.S. universities to be operating in China. They should, uh, but not when it, at the cost, I think, of some of the basic sort of fundamental freedoms uh, and branding, in a sense, putting the stamp of a Duke or a NYU uh, or a Berkeley on what is document 30 in China, the sort of washing away of Western influence. Uh, or giving away academic freedom. That's not something that we think is good long-term for U.S. interests, nor is it long good for U.S. perceptions uh, of China uh, by the students that uh, you know, are on these programs, uh, nor is it good for the Chinese people themselves. So uh, with that, we're going to wrap it up. Now, I, um, I know there's probably many other questions, and the last session ended with you know, Michael Horowitz asking everyone to come up and, and you know, clap for those uh, who have been persecuted or in, in prison or have had families in jail. I've always thought of my job as being an advocate for you. That I work for you. And I think the other people on this panel, I think, probably agree as well. Uh, I draw my, my strength, uh, I draw my inspiration from your stories, from the things that you go through or have gone through, for the things that you do. Uh, on a day-to-day -day basis, uh, you know, both where in China, or for your families in China, or your ethnic communities in China, or uh, you know what you've done in the past, uh, Teng Biao, uh, you know, for standing up for human rights defenders. But there's others here as well. So uh, I want to say that I work for you, and I'd like to give you uh, a, a round of applause. So uh, with that, we're going to wrap it up, and uh, you know, we'll, we'll uh, thank the panelists and, and give a round of applause for them as well.